Uh, welcome, everybody, to another episode of Face the Truth. Uh, this is really awesome. Uh, I'm so so excited to have this guy on. He, we've been friends for like, eons. It's been a long time. A uh, long time ago, we used to have the same agent. Uh, that's how we first met, but we never met in person. Um, so it's always just been communication. I went all the way to Australia once. I think it was 2010, and I called him, and he answered the phone, but he was in L.A. Uh, true story. And uh, so I had to go all the way there just to talk to him in L.A. Uh, but anyways, uh, this guy is uh, just an inspiring uh, artist. He's an amazing painter. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's, let's just uh, – everybody, woo! Robin Ile. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks, Jess. Um, <laughs> from the jump, I, I, I figure it might be interesting to just chat quickly about um, – how to pronounce surnames. Is, 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 it, Eli, have... is it Eli or e, e, Eli? <laughs> is it Sealer or Siler? Siler, yeah. I know, because I know that I know I, I know that you have this uh, this hang up about your Oh, so... I hate oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've had the same thing happen to me throughout my life. It's actually E Lee. Robin E. Lee. Um, but okay, everyone, please welcome Robin E. Lee. That's but yeah, that's right. Yeah, so there I go. <laughs> I have I have like um I have uh, sections of uh, groups of friends. You know, like I have. So I used to play a lot of basketball. So all my basketball friends think it's Eli, and it's I've just never bothered to correct them. And and so to those guys, I'm Robin Eli, and I just let it go. <laughs> and I always thought it was funny. Like I know that you have this Silas Sealer thing, and mine's Eli Eli. So it's kind of yeah. like this thing that um, I deal with all the time, but I think that I, it doesn't bother me as much as it seems to bother you. I don't really care anymore. When I was a, <laughs> when I was, when I was a kid, it was really annoying, and I I used to like like my teachers for for one thing. You have got an English teacher, and they're they're like Mr. Sealer, and it's like you know what? Do you say Frankenstein? No, it's Frankenstein. Okay, yeah. it's like it's not Heinz fifty seven. It's Heinz fifty seven. It's yeah, Germ- it's German. You know, it's like you know, but whatever. But yeah, now it's not a big deal. It's like it, it happens all the time. I say people's Are names wrong. Now, so wrong. So you know, uh, I always say everyone's name wrong. So it's 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 yeah. totally normal for me. But um, <laughs> that's awesome. So um, how you been, man? Good, really good. Like life is crazy. You know, we've got um, I've got two kids now, twins, and uh, just turned three. So every day is just like one going to battle every day. It's it's an awesome, just yeah. exhilarating kind of existence, and you know what it's like. But um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's it's tiring. I don't have the time or energy that I used to have. But I I just you know you just have to make it work. And yeah, um, yeah especially living where I live, I think you've seen a little bit of where I live. Like it's yeah. uh, it's, it's not a it's not a relaxing part of the world. It's quite a, a hectic part of the world too. So. Um, yeah, all of those things make it. Um, I don't know life. It's just kind of perfect right now. Like it's just a lot of. I just like to be busy and and life yeah. just keep busy. Yeah. How did you actually end up uh, where you are right now? Um, well, we moved out to LA from Australia in 2014, like middle of 2014, and I was moving out here to work with a gallery, and um, and uh, the gallery was based sort of around the West Hollywood area, and um, they just said, you know, get a place in West Hollywood, and you, you should be fine. So we moved out here, and we had an Airbnb for three weeks, and and um, we decided we found a place, and um, we 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 got the place, and we've just been here. Uh, since then so it's been you know, five and a half years um and we, we're probably gonna we're gonna have to move eventually because it's we're in a one-bedroom apartment with with four people so it's getting small oh, but yeah. yeah yeah it's pretty crowded but I'm, i've got an amazing work situation in that my studio i rent the penthouse in the same building i live in so whereas most people in la will commute for like an hour to get to work i commute for um 45 seconds i walk from my door to the elevator elevator up to the penthouse and so it's it's a, it's an incredible situation because i can just put that at time save back into family time yeah. and go back to work after the kids go to bed and um it just really works well the thing is just the lack of space in our apartment is, is starting to creep yeah, yeah. <laughs> now it's funny you got you so you you had twins was that something like um, that was a crazy surprise to you guys, or is that in your family? The whole twin uh, thing. It was a, 
it was a surprise, but it wasn't a surprise. Um, we had we tried to have kids for um, a long time, and uh, we eventually uh, started doing IVF, and we we've uh. done it a couple of times and didn't work. And then the third time, we were like, okay, so um, let's let's double let's double our chances and. Uh, let, Let's, let's put two embryos in and um, the doctor said, well, you know that there's an increased risk of having twins and but no, whatever, we're, you know, this will be fine. We put it in and then um, so then we went to the, the ultrasound. We found out we were pregnant. A few weeks later, we went for the ultrasound and the doctor said, so whose idea was it to put two in? And um, we just looked at each other and we're like, oh, my God. <laughs> and yeah. it was incredible because we always wanted to have two and then we found out that we're having a boy and a girl so we just kind of we caught. I feel like we we caught up on um, a lot of life almost in an instant. You know, we wanted to have a boy, yeah. and we wanted to have two kids, and all of a sudden, you know, we have we have two, and and life is like a kind of a roller coaster now. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's funny because uh, I, I've thought about that before. Because I mean, I was following along the whole time, and you were doing you did that really awesome painting with the little pieces. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. remember exactly what that was called, but that was cool. I got a little piece. I got a little piece of that. Yeah. Thing. Um, but uh, I had my, – my wife and I had a baby two years ago now. But it was funny because just before um, uh, we knew exactly what was going on. We knew that she was pregnant, but it was like still early. I was having just every single night dreams about having twins. Like, oh, really But more like, more like panic dreams not you know because yeah. i already have like i have a 16 year old and i have a 12 year old yeah. and i was just thinking like it's already weird to start over again and have a, a baby now like after all this time and i was just thinking my luck it's gonna be twins <laughs> <It's> gonna, <laughs> and i just like how i don't know man that's gonna be so crazy um but it wasn't but uh but there's always uh chances that could happen again but uh yeah. but that's just always like it just seems like such a especially just jumping into parenthood right away to mm -hmm. just going from no kids to twins, you know, that's got to be uh, quite yeah. the experience. <laughs> it was, but, you know, we were ready and um, my wife is she's incredible. And I, I just applied my same sort of philosophies that I, that I have with my work to, to being a dad in terms of just getting things done and maximizing, like, efficiency. And I always uh, would think about, you know, when I'm feeding them breakfast, you know, like when you give you – know, you take the, uh, the porridge and you give – the mouthful to one and while that one's chewing you then you can feed the other one so there's like um, efficiency <laughs> that's hilarious with twins and like just trying to compress each sort of routine uh down um as much as possible because you know as an as an artist as you know you know time is just so valuable and yeah. um but also time with the kids is valuable so i didn't want to really sacrifice either because i didn't i couldn't you know yeah that's the tricky thing man um yeah, it's still something that I have to deal with. I mean, it, it doesn't change when your kids get older. Then it's like, oh, now they're now they're doing things with older kids, and it's like, oh, I got to drive halfway across the town and all this kind it's of stuff. It's a moving target. Like, I, yeah. I, like every day, like I feel like okay, now I've I've solved the uh, the the breakfast tantrum problem. But then it's like, okay, so all of a sudden now they're too big to fit in their high chairs, which is coming soon. So what do we, how do we have breakfast there? And so the, the target keeps moving. The problems evolve, and um, you just got to. Just gotta find a way to make it work. I just picture you with uh, like like you got like a porridge palette, where you're like, <laughs> you actually have a palette and you're just like mixing some little put a little bit of blueberries in this one and what? a little bit bananas in this. One. <laughs> it's funny to say that what I used to do was um, so like I'd feed one and they get porridge all over their face and then I'd so I'd feed the other one with the face scrapings of the other one. So I'd scrape <laughs> porridge of one and feed to the other one. So yeah. there is kind of like an art form to it. Yeah, It'd that's hilarious. It's worth if you want. That's so funny, man. That's awesome. Yeah, man. So, so man, when we first, when I first met you, ah, oh, gosh, I think it must have been two thousand six or seven, something like that. I remember um, exactly. Let, like, let, let me tell you about how I remember meeting, how I remember okay. encountering you because it, I, it sticks out to me so vividly. I remember I just come back from New York. It was. Um, 2006 and I just met with uh, Sari Levy uh, <clears throat> I'd been I'd been putting contact with her through one of my great friends Andrea Wickland who's an incredible illustrator and oh, I met yeah. with Sari in New York and she said she wanted to sign me as in, as one of her new illustrators for her agency and um, I got back and she emailed me and she said I've just signed another guy 
was like, this is other guy. <laughs> could be uh, anywhere close to where I was. I didn't really think that, but I was kind of like, you know, who is this other guy? And I remember I opened the email and there was this painting he'd done of uh, Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> and um, I remember looking at it thinking to myself, holy shit. Um, and, I, and I was like, there's not, is that a, what is that? I couldn't work out whether it was like, <laughs> like what you had done to it, to make this image. And, and like, I'd been sort of, I'd only just started painting like a couple of years ago. And so I was like developing like my craft and I was trying to get this sense of realism. And I was sort of really trying to shoehorn caricature into my work because I felt like it needed it. And then all of a sudden I see your work and I just wanted, I felt like I wanted to give up. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah, and I just remember, like, I, I just remember being kind of, you know, you probably get it when you look at some artist's work where you just don't understand how it's possible, but it's so good, and your your heart kind of sinks a little bit, and you get that pit in your stomach. Um, that's kind of how, how I feel I, when I see your stuff. Well, that's <laughs> how I felt when I saw yours. So, um, but then, like, I think we we talked a couple of times, and I was like, man, this guy's exactly like I pictured him to be through his work, and and you didn't beca you became a friend and not so threatening and so but that was yeah 2006 so like, yeah 13 funny. years ago yeah yeah that's that's funny well i remember too like it was it was interesting because i remember when i first started seeing your work i was like oh this guy's awesome and i and i was impressed because it was all acrylic um at the time it was all acrylic and acrylic is a bitch it's like it's an annoying medium and i and i was I'm very familiar with it i've done a lot of paintings with it so i i was like wow this guy's really pushing things and i remember watching like the first couple pieces I remember seeing, I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. But then all of a sudden, I remember like you, like like leaps and bounds. Like you, all of a sudden, you. I remember this one piece you did, where I was like, oh wow, okay, he's going somewhere else now. Like you did, it was like, it was like some kind of illustrated image where I think half of it was underwater or something like that. Oh, yeah. um, there was like I don't remember what the image is exactly, but I remember it being underwater and like the the difference between the sky and underneath, like just all the detail and the color changes, and I was just like damn he's he's like pushed himself somewhere else now man and it just get, got better and better and then i remember having a talk with you once and you were like yeah i think i'm gonna quit illustration like i think i'm just gonna be a fine artist and i think i remember being like well, good luck dude because like <laughs> ga galleries are terrible and i remember at the time um my dad's uh, like into fine art stuff and, and i was like i remember like briefly talking with you saying like the galleries take like like 70 percent or something and it's like it's really hard and and then all of a sudden, I I didn't see you for a little bit, like your work. Um, I think you did a couple illustration stuff here and there. I remember, um, but then all of a sudden, I started seeing like these oil paintings. I think I saw the first one. I really noticed. I think one was of your dad. I think like mm -hmm. maybe with his shirt off or something like that. Yeah. And it was like so completely uh, on a different planet compared to what you were doing with your illustration. Mm -hmm. And it was and it was weird because I remember. At the time, I, I also remember you never used oils before. No. Like, and it, all of a sudden, you're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit illustration. I'm gonna be a fine artist, and I'm gonna focus on getting gallery work, and I'm gonna start working in oils. And I remember literally <laughs> thinking, Yeah, good luck. You, you, yeah. You can't just jump into that. And, yeah. And well, you kind of did. <laughs> it was yeah, crazy. It, it, <clears throat> yeah, it's one of those things that you. Um, I always think that. Um, you know, I, 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 I research a lot and I think a lot and I work really hard, but I have, I have this, or I had back then like this little sort of touch of naivety and ignorance that I just thought it was going to work out. And so I didn't hesitate. I just went for it. And, um, and that, that's something that uh, I try to hold on to a little bit. And I think is it's probably missing in a lot of young artists today because they just know so much about everything in terms of their industry and where they want to go. I just, I didn't know. And I, I had no idea that what I was going up against was as big of a thing as it was. Um, but I just went for it. Uh, it was, yeah. So like illustration for me was, I was, I was all in, like for me, it was, it was everything. But, um, slowly, like I, I, my thoughts began to evolve and it like started at like a really sort of small voice in my head, but eventually it kind of grew to this, to this point where, um, I was 32 and um illustration was going great and i i knew that i could continue doing it for the rest of my career but i also knew that if i did um eventually i wouldn't 
enjoy it anymore. And not to say that I wasn't enjoying it at the time, because I was, but I was able to project into the future and I could see that it wasn't going to be something that I wanted to do when I was in my 50s and 60s, um, <clears throat> times when I'd still be working, but I just I didn't want to be doing the kind of stuff I was doing because I was banging out three paintings a week. I was because I was living in Australia. I was getting up at like three in the morning doing photo shoots for um, like the Wall Street Journal uh, illustrations at three in the morning. It was just it was really difficult, um, kind of exciting. But um, once you've seen your work, once I'd seen my work sort of in these places a few times, that the thrill of seeing it in publication, it was still um, exciting, but it wasn't like thrilling it wasn't something yeah. that was driving me to get up in the morning um so but also i felt like i had other things that i wanted to do with my work and so <clears throat> the big catalyst was um i went on my i got married late 2009 and went on my honeymoon and you know that moments like that really cause you to reevaluate where you're going in your life and um and it was on my honeymoon um where i just i made the determination that i was going to abandon it's kind of, I felt bad. It's a bit of a bait and switch for my wife. It was like she married one person and on the honeymoon. I literally, literally on the honeymoon told her that I'm going to go for something else. Um, and that's when, you know, you said that I kind of disappeared for a while. I basically did. I went underground. I, I took on some advertising work, which as you know, like it's, it's the worst work, but it pays well. Yeah. So I, so I did some bunch of really, uh, uh, somewhat depressing advertising work but it was enough so that i could work for short periods of time um but still make enough money to survive but during yeah. the and so what i was doing then was taking that um taking the, the time that i would have spent doing other stuff and investing it into uh, building a portfolio of paintings and that also involved teaching myself how to oil paint which i'd never done before i had i had no idea i was 32 and i i'd, I'd avoided painting until i was 27 painting like all together so i avoided oil painting until i was 32 i didn't even know i remember i tried to take a class once and um and it was it was not a good class the teacher really didn't teach us anything but i remember taking my brushes and my palette outside after the class and running the faucet and trying to clean my oil brushes and my palette with water <laughs> Because I didn't know that that's not how you and and you know this sounds ridiculous and it, to me it sounds ridiculous saying it but I was I was pushing thirty when I took that class and I ended up just dropping out of the class because I just realised I didn't know what I was doing so and I kicked the can down the road but eventually it was like okay now I'm now I got to I got to learn and so I just bought myself some time and um, talked to some friends bought some books and just dove in and just ha and haven't stopped since. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's crazy. And I mean, it's awesome too. I, it's funny cause th there's, you know, I watch your paintings, I watch your process. You'll, you'll share some things sometimes and it, it is interesting. I mean, I'm pretty much self-taught as well. Um, I, my dad is an artist, but you yeah. know, I kind of did that teenage thing where I blew him off. You know, he, he, when he tried to show me some things, I was just like, yeah, I just want to draw Batman or whatever. And, yeah. um, and, and then by the time, I needed to learn from my dad. I was already living on my own, like eight hours away. And so it was just, I basically just jumped into it on my own. Um, and so same thing with like, like I, you know, I taught myself like watercolor first and then acrylic. Um, and then eventually it was the oil painting. And, mm -hmm. but I, I kind of, I've kind of always had like this approach where, um, this is this. I have a point to this because I've noticed something about your technique, and I'm just curious because mm. I've always had this approach when I'm painting that I try. I'm trying to uh, bring the whole image together at one time, so I, <laughs> yeah. so, so I don't just focus on one thing. I kind of, I kind of like block in the whole thing. I'm just like, and I start shaping and forming and just bringing it all. Um, and I've noticed with you, it seems like you'll you almost like have the whole thing drawn out, and then you just you just like you'll go into one section and just finish it to like a final in one section and mm -hmm. just move around. Um, is that just, is that yeah. just something you started doing and you just stuck with it or cause, cause for me, it's a, it's when I see it, I'm like, that's so weird how he does that. Cause yeah, it doesn't, it, it kind of, um, it's om it almost, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but if it, it makes me feel, um, a lot of anxiety when I see yeah. it. 
it's not a good way to do it. Um, <laughs> but, it <laughs> but it's the way I do it. Um, yeah. I, I think that if, if, if you could crack open my head and, and your head and scoop out the thoughts that are inside, as we're thinking, they're quite similar. Like I'm th- constantly thinking of, of value, temperature, yeah. lighter, darker, warmer, cooler, pushing, pulling, all that kind of stuff. But I'm doing it within like a really narrow, small areas. Um, and I, for me, it's that way of painting lines up most directly with, with how I think and my personality. Um, and I think that's an important point um, because for a long time when I was, when I was studying and like, I was always told that my biggest weakness was that I was too tight and my biggest weakness was I had to loosen up and all these kinds of things were, that made me feel like I had to do to work in a certain way, that I had to fit a mold similar to um, – more traditional ways of painting, like start looser and bring it to like a higher, higher resolution, loose, higher resolution finish, but start loose. Mm. Um, and every time I try, I always felt like I was performing like an actor on a stage performing for an audience. Mm. Um, and, yeah. and I didn't know, and, and gradually I, I started to realize that to me, like there's there no point in that because it felt disingenuous. And, um, so then when I gave myself permission to just be myself, I went back to the way of painting that is natural to me. Um, it's not a smart way to do it. It's not an easy way to do it, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Uh, but again, the thought processes are the same. Um, but when people talk about I, I don't think of myself – I, as what, what I do is paint, it's like coloring. It's like super advanced coloring in. Like there isn't, there's no, there's no like uh, fancy brushwork. There's no um, expression in, in, in the way the paint is applied. There's no texture to my surface. It is literally coloring in. And um, that's because I, I kind of lean pretty hard into, the, into uh, that's just me. That's my way of yeah. working. That that's the parameters I have, and and so what can I do with that as an artist? What can I make from that way of working? And that's kind of how I arrive at the things that I arrive at for my work. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I'm, I only brought it up just because I I always just feel like, wow, this is so interesting. This is like, uh, I've I've seen a couple other artists doing that as well, but um, it's just it's just interesting to see that approach. Cause like, mm-hmm. like I said, like I, sometimes I see it and I'm like, I start feeling a little nervous cause like <laughs> I start thinking about, uh, I guess, I guess, you know, what? it, it, a lot like with my, my approach is I, I sometimes, um, I have a hard time when I'm working on, like right now I'm doing an illustration that's got several people in it and I find it really difficult. Like I'm working on one person and then all of a sudden I just hop over and I realize, oh my gosh, I, I wanted to finish this person first, but now I realize I'm working on this person mm-hmm. and, and I, I just, I end up just hopping all over the place. And then even when I'm on the yeah. person's face, I, I'm like, let's, let's try to get these eyes done. Cause that's, you know, let's get that done so I can move on to something else. But then I notice all of a sudden I'm painting the forehead, you know what I mean? So I'm like, mm-hmm. so it's interesting. I'm always just hopping over, you know, all the <laughs> I, I do the exact same thing. Like I don't paint like like a printer like it's not like going yeah. like lines i'm hopping around because i'm looking for information and sometimes i'm painting something that when i look at it or i look at my reference and i look at my palette i'm not quite sure so i'll, I'll shift over to it and to the area next to it where i'm a little more sure and so i'm, I'm constantly moving around looking to um looking for the f- quickest path to mm result trying to often i try to sneak up on things so so like if for instance like if you like a forehead right i'll never paint a forehead from one side to the other yeah i will paint one side to there then the other side to there and i'll sneak up on the middle so when i get to the middle part usually all like here where the highlight is i've got information on both sides mm. and that, that i can that i can make a judgment call as to what goes into the middle of that um i find if i work from one side to the other um, my my guesses and they're always guesses. Uh, they get increasingly less accurate as I go over to the point where by the time I get over to the other side, the values are either usually uh, too blown out, um, the temperature's wrong. Uh, but if I can if I can uh, 
make make smaller guesses in, in in other areas it's kind of like trying to guess a number you know like and you start higher or lower and you and you you guess on either side of it and you gradually work your way that's kind of the way i'm thinking as i'm painting yeah that's awesome and the other thing too is you uh i think one thing like the, the, the approach that you have in your painting which is um unique um and interesting it's your own way you're doing it but also what i think helps is and this is one of the things i love about your work is you always have like such a strong concept you've always got like a um like you're doing a series you're always doing some kind of a series where hey this is my plan for this series and it's incredible man it's really cool to see that you're you're always you always got a goal i'm sure you're working on a whole series now of some whole new idea but you're you <laughs> The, the thing I love is that it's never the same. You're mm -hmm. always doing something like whether you're fracturing things apart um, or like one of my favorites is is the um, – um, why am I blanking on – like the like the cellophane or like the um, – just the weird textures going over, he, over people. Um, it, it's just – it's really cool because obviously painting people is one thing. But now you're introducing this like – transparent textures and all these different things and it's changing the tone and the values of the skin underneath versus the skin showing and it's like all those kind of ideas i just love your approach to um you know whatever series you're working on i think it's really exciting you know it brings people yeah. in and you know um and it's it's crazy too because you you do so many paintings <laughs> you know it's like it's like one like the i really love the ones you've been doing recently too of um or actually it's not as recent, but where you're doing like old master paintings and then making it yeah. look like they're covered in plastic and tape and then adding the texture around, which is mm -hmm. brilliant. But uh, what, how did that come up about that idea? Like you're just sitting around one day and be like, oh, this would be interesting and, and then well, I got to figure out how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a very specific story about how that came about. So um, you might – just to back up, like that that whole sort of progression of ideas from one thing to the next, that started out with the people with the plastic and that evolved. The series got a little darker, um, brought in sort of other elements like paper and cellophane and, and uh, uh, aluminum or aluminium for those international listeners, <laughs> aluminium foil. Um, and then it sort of – then I started uh, using like uh, working in 3D software and doing uh, 3D uh, – uh, 3D sculptures of like uh, low poly sculptures of people's heads in 3D programmed and using. Oh yeah, that's right. To fracture an image, a painting yeah. of the same person, and make the actual sculpture, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it evolved further into, and I was going kind of down this rabbit hole of um, using uh, digital devices to fracture and, and and collide with traditional artwork, and um, and I had an exhibition open in like 2017. And um, it's called Lossless. And the work, I was really proud of it. But when I finished the work, I felt like I'd reached the end of, end of that road. And I thought that if I pushed any further down that path, I wouldn't recognize the, uh, the artist making the work. And, um, and that's something that I never wanted. That's not why I got into what I'm into, into this game. That's not why I left illustration. It, it, it's in fact the exact opposite. I, I am doing what I'm doing because I just want to make the stuff I want to make. And I felt like I was bending f towards something that wasn't me. So mm. um, I had a bit of a, a, a moment, a crisis of, of confidence. And um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a breakdown, but it kind of felt like a bit <laughs> of a breakdown where I just um, had no sense of where to go, no, no idea of where to turn with my work. Um, all I knew that was the path that I was on was not the path I wanted to be on anymore. And, um, so I, after my exhibition, it was May, uh, 2017, I set myself, uh, one goal and one, and one goal only. And that was whatever I made next, whatever series I committed to. Um, I wanted it to be, um, a career defining moment, uh, something that would be, I guess looked upon as as the defining work of my career, so um, I started thinking, and and it was the most difficult months of my life. I had turned myself inside out. I, I had four or five or six fully formed ideas, fully researched folders in my computer with like notes and everything. And every time I would, every idea that I had, 
I'd get to the point where, okay, maybe I can start making this. Maybe I can start like buying the stuff to create the reference material. Mm. And then I, then I think to myself, wait, I need to hold it up to that standard. And so I'd hold it up to the standard of, it, would this be defi- career defining? And nothing was coming up to that standard. And it was really difficult. And the months were ticking by. Um, during this time, I started up my art, art school. I was uh, finishing off demos old demos, uh, unfinished paintings, just something to keep my mind busy, keep my hands busy, and something that I could potentially sell because I wasn't making anything significant at the time because I didn't know what to make. Um, and the months were ticking by. We're up to about um, seven months. We're seven months into this now, and I've still, I got, I've still got nothing. And mm. um, But one, th- one thing had started to emerge in my thought process, and that was the idea of um, famous images, images that had been created by someone for one purpose, but had been become so famous that they'd, they'd been co-opted by a popular culture and put to another purpose. And um, and the idea of famous paintings was something that was was really like at the forefront of my mind. I was looking at famous paintings in fashion and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, um, it's like November. It's almost two years ago now, like late November 2017. It had been six months of like just anxiety every day <laughs> and um and i still had nothing uh when i feel like this exercise becomes important for me like so i so i was going for a lot of runs and so like i lived just below sunset boulevard you know like the comedy store where you were that night yeah um so i, I walked up that street to where the comedy store is and i uh, just started running uh west along sunset boulevard and i remember it was like late in the day and the sun was setting and um i'm running along sunset and um, I run past this uh, office lobby that's being renovated. And um, inside the office lobby, I can see it. There's there's dust everywhere. But whatever they're doing in there, they hadn't bothered to take any of the furniture out. The furniture, they just put plastic sheets over it, over the coffee table, over the the couch, over the chairs. And even like this, one of those you know really crappy office lobby paintings that are hanging on the wall, someone's just draped a piece of plastic over it and wrapped some tape around it. And so I'm running and I see this thing on the wall and um, I just like, huh, that was pretty cool. So I stop and I just like, just like run back and look back at it. And I'm standing there looking at it and thinking, that's really cool. I, I used to, um, I remember to myself, I used to paint things wrapped in plastic back in the day, back in like 20, <laughs> 2012, 2013. Yeah. And so I start running again and it was, I don't get like 50 yards down the road. And I swear to God, it was like somebody just punched me in the face and the idea just hits me. It's like f- famous paintings with with the plastic around them. And um, so I start running, and so I and I keep running. So I end up running for like an hour and a half, and I've got this I this sort of this kernel of an idea in my head, and I'm trying to think like how do I do this in a in a way that is special? Because what I didn't want to do was do like a still life painting of a painting wrapped in plastic. What I wanted to do was actually create a replica of the physical painting and make it look as though it actually was wrapped in plastic. So how do I do that? And so I decided on my run, literally with this is seven, six or seven months of, of killing myself. And then within 45 minutes of, of running, I've, I've got this whole thing figured out. I know how I'm going to mm-hmm. do the paintings. I'm going to make them the exact size of the original to, yeah. to, to this, to the millimeter. And I know the stuff that I want to use to try to build out the edges of the canvas. And I think that I can paint it in such a way that when you view it front on, it looks convincingly wrapped, like it's going to be wrapped in plastic. And so I got back and I was like, okay, so if I'm going to redirect my career instantly, the best thing for me to do is to do the most famous painting I can. So I I literally got on Google and thought, okay, what does the internet say is the most famous painting in the world? I think I know what it is. So I Googled and two paintings come up. Number one is Mona Lisa. Number two is Girl with the Pearl Earring. Yeah. So I look at the dimensions. Girl with the Pearl Earring is smaller. I didn't wasn't, know whether it wasn't Jason Siler's Napoleon Dynamite? The- that, that was number three. <laughs> yeah. Number three was the bullet. Um, <laughs> but um, so, I, so that one's smaller. So it's less of a commitment yeah. in, in money and time. So I order a print of that. And I make this painting and I get a few days into it. And I'm thinking this is, this could be something. Then when I finish it and the edges are all done and, and I'm looking at it thinking, I, th- I think I might have something here. So I start the Mona Lisa one. 
halfway through the Mona Lisa one, I'm thought, I think to myself, I'm just going to put this girl with the pearl earring one on Instagram, um, just like a little work in progress. Throw it up on Instagram and literally like a couple hours later, um, my gallery owner calls me and says, um, I've sold the painting. Uh, what? Sold the painting? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my um, gosh. And so, oh, okay, great. Um, but like I could see the, um, the the response to it. And you, know, you don't want to judge it by like just like a public Instagram response. But I could see like the the engagement and the level of interest in the work. I really thought thought that I was on something. So um, finished the Mona Lisa when I throw that one up online and get a call that day from my gallery owner, um, sold the painting, like same day. By this time, I like I know that like something's happening, um, and so I, I keep making them, um, and that's that's kind of where I'm at now. I've done a few other things in between that, but um, I'm now working on a, a massive exhibition of, and and the idea that the, the execution and idea is evolving. I'm now not just doing plastic, but I'm working on ones with foam sheeting, bubble wrap. Other other things, and the paintings aren't just wrapped; they're, they're like packaged. Um, so I'm working on a huge exhibition now that I'm really excited about. I, I I'm going to have to be one of those guys that like says I'm doing something awesome, but I can't really tell you yeah, what yeah. it is because. <laughs> but um, I'm working. I'm so, so I'm working with a um, a gentleman who by the name of David Corrins. Who, if anyone Google's David Corrins, you'll see what he's done, and he, he's he's amazing. He's regarded. Um, as the, the, pre, the preeminent set designer in the world. He's one of the creative team behind the musical Hamilton. He's, mm. uh, uh, he did the Oscars this past year. He's, he's just done Beetlejuice on Broadway. Um, Dear Evan Hansen, um, Kanye West, creative director for a number of years. Anyway, this guy, he's become a really good friend of mine and a, a patron of my work, but more than that, a really good friend. And we are working on a huge exhibition that's going to be probably a couple of years in the making um, set for New York in 2021. And that will, so the whole idea of this, um, and I wish I could tell you more about it, but the idea is to, to take the work that I've been doing of these rap paintings and actually put it in context, um, deliver the concept behind it. Because up until now, um, when viewed individually, that work can very easily be dismissed as a gimmick. And yeah. I'm fully aware of that. And it was never never conceived as a gimmick, but um, it was. But without without sort of the context and and the um, the gravitas of like an actual uh, exhibition where you take these things and and they come together with an actual meaning behind it, um, the work can can be disregarded. And I'm fully aware of that. So that's what I'm working on now and it's 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 a massive massive undertaking but I'm super excited so I'm, I'm, like, I've been talking too long but yeah oh no no it's great um yeah. I, I was curious I mean I don't know if this is like uh giving away too many secrets or anything uh so you know forgive me if it is or but like I I, I look at those paintings and I think now how would I do those paintings like how would I because I'm just trying to like because they're so impressive I I just love um, to be able to see the, the process and the steps, it's just amazing to see because they really do, like when you see them as a whole, it looks like the painting wrapped up and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and I like how sometimes you're, you'll post and you'll, a video where you show it and you're like, see, it's flat, you know, mm -hmm. and you'll like turn it and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But um, when you do it, are you – are you um, do you – for reference sake, or do you have, print out the exact – size of, of the of the real painting and then mm -hmm. actually wrap it in things and then photograph that um yep. so, so you can see how how the painting is going to look underneath the plastic yeah. like that kind of okay yeah this is one of the great benefits of being an illustrator is is when you need to get reference you work out how to do it and you do it yeah um so all of my projects I've called back to my experience of of churning out illustrations like two or three times a week having to light things correctly going to whatever lengths i need to go to to get the reference right and you're you're correct with with what i'm doing now um all of the paintings that i've done so far they're all public domain they're all very old paintings you can just go on wikipedia and download like the girl the pearl earring file or the starry night file it's like half a gigabyte it's ridiculous so you download it and then i go and get it printed um my process right now is i get it printed on paper 
and then I, I get the stretches made. Um, I work on uh, aluminium stretches now with, uh, with canvas. I used to be on Belgian linen with uh, wood stretches, but now I've changed to aluminium with, um, with canvas. And uh, so I stretch, get the canvas stretched over the aluminium, and the print is done at exactly the same size, right? So say it's like a 36 by 28 painting. I get the print done that size. The print's actually done like fractionally bigger, and then I then I uh, get it printed, and then I wrap it onto the canvas. And so now, when you hold it up, it looks like a canvas printed the uh, painting on it. Um, and that's also the canvas that I'm going to use, excuse me, to do the painting. And then I take whatever it is that I'm wrapping it with, and I spend anywhere from ten minutes if I get like massively, massively lucky to two or three days wrapping this thing, unwrapping it, wrapping it, taping it, ripping it, trying to, and this is where the sort of, I guess the art comes into it, trying yeah. to design something that is visually um, intriguing. And it's not just a matter of just draping some plastic over it. It's, it takes, it takes a lot of time. Like the light's got to hit it right. There's got to be enough depth to the shadows. There's got to be a nice kind of uh, arrangement, like I'm using tape, um, a nice way of arranging the tape sort of that directs the eye. And again, this comes back to being a, like a, an illustrator and an image maker, having to put together a, a, a painting that, that works um, well and keeps the viewer inside, especially when you're working with a painting that's already been done. Like I'm, I'm confined to like the Mona Lisa is the Mona Lisa and I can't do anything compositionally with that, but I can wrap it in a way that um, doesn't make it more interesting, but makes it something different. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so that's what I do. And it sometimes takes me a long time. Like one that I've just done recently is a huge one and um, like five and a half feet tall, like four times the size of the biggest one I've done. And um, for that, I needed the plastic to look like it had been around for decades. And so I took a huge sheet of plastic, laid it, because I'm very lucky I'm on the roof of my building. I laid it out on the roof for a month and a half, laid this sheet of plastic out for a month and a half and just let it bake in the sun, let it accumulate uh, dirt. And um, I put like some pieces of metal on there. So there's rust on there and just let this plastic sit out there for wow. about 40 or 50 days. And so when I brought it in and wrapped the, the reference, it had that look of being like it had been wrapped like 30 years ago, which is what I was going for. Um, so, yeah, I always think that – I remember uh, uh, C.F. Payne, I'm sure you know Chris Payne. Yeah. Um, he uh, – when I was studying under him at the Illustration Academy, he, he always said, you know, the best image makers, they always use the best reference. And so do what you can to get the best reference you possibly can get. And that's just stuck with me. And so, like, I don't half-ass the reference. I don't – I'm not good enough to make things up. I'm just – I just can't do it. Um, but if I can get my reference onto a screen or onto a printout, then I know that I can paint it. Like I've, uh, I just know that I can do it because that's that's just the way I paint. So yeah. yeah. Now you, um, as far as the painting process goes, are do you are you no longer doing like underpaintings? Are you you just go straight to like just direct? Um, yeah, I, for me, so much of it is about about time. Um, so back in the day, like when I first started, I, I would um, have my reference and I would hand draw everything and <clears throat> do an underpainting and then uh, do the, uh, the grisaille, like white sort of, mm -hmm. you know, the burnt umber underpainting with the white. And that process um, would, would add, you know, sometimes weeks onto a painting. And um, the result that I would get would end up looking exactly like the reference that I would be working from. And that was great. But as I progressed and time really began, began to loom large in my mind as a, as a factor in, in my work, um, I started looking at ways to sort of trim down my process. And the first thing that I cut out, uh, and people may criticize me for this, but I, I don't give a shit, I, I stopped drawing. I just, I just started tracing my, my reference because um, what was the point? Yeah. What? I know I wanted to look exactly like my reference. I could sit there and, and agonize over a, over, over a drawing for five or six days, or I could trace it and be done in half a day. Um, yeah. And cumulative well, that's what, of that. That's what so. Rockwell did the same thing. And, and people yeah. like, I've heard people say, 
oh, he just traced. It's like, no, he composed it. He photographed it. He can draw it. What does he have to prove? Like, yeah. it's, it is kind of silly. <laughs> well, that was the thing for me. Like, for me, it was about proving. Um, and, and so I've been taught by some of, like, the world's best drawers, like guys who just, you know, you, you look at them drawing and you just want to give up. And so I, I felt like I always wanted to prove to myself or, or to them that I could do it. And, and after a while, I realized that's just that's pure ego. That's all, that's all it is. Um, and so I, I just – the only thing I was concerned about is being able to tell someone that, I, yes, I actually did draw that first. What was the point? So um, I cut that out. And then the underpainting thing, I cut that out too because it just didn't – it, it makes – so like it makes the painting maybe a few percent better maybe but it also takes a lot more time and I had – there's a, like a cost benefit to that. So yeah, I don't think that it's worth the time for how much it makes the painting better and and also like I, I thought it would be a nice challenge for myself to see whether I could just kind of hit it on the first pass and you know if i don't then i go back and i work over things like i I'll gla- yeah. i started glazing for the first time on this last painting i did because i had a whole section of the, like the shadow side of the painting that was just too light and it's like do i it's like five and a half feet by two feet of shadow side and do i go back and paint that all that's like four weeks or do i glaze over it and um take you know half a day and uh, i I'd never tried glazing before, but I did it. And, you know, it probably wasn't as good as repainting it, but, you know, it's 95% of what repainting it would have been. Yeah. And it's time saving of, you know, almost two weeks. So, you know, always, always thinking about that because I think that there's a, there's a power in volume and as, as when it comes to being an artist, um, the more you can make without losing quality, uh, the further your work can spread. Um, the more things you can do. And so I'm trying to always think of ways that I can increase my volume because it's, I'm never going to be a guy that makes 40 or 50 paintings a year, but I want to be a guy that can make 25, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm trying. Well, I mean, it's like every, there's, there's so many different ways to skin a cat. Right. I mean, like there's like the, like that's the thing that's awesome about oil, oil painting in general, I think is that there's so many techniques and different approaches. I mean, like I, I've done the same thing where, like I've done the full on raw umber and white underpainting, um, which is a lot of fun to do. And then, you know, you get it just right. And then mm-hmm. you can start going in with the color. Um, and then, you know, you start to realize, wow, that took a long time. And then, mm-hmm. and then maybe I just, you know, cause actually going back, what I usually do is I usually, um, you know, I know exactly the size of my canvas is going to be. So I draw it all out, even like digitally or whatever to the right proportions, print it out, my sketch tile it so I can like put it on the canvas just right. So I'm, I'm not wasting any time with the drawing mm-hmm. process. I already did it on the computer. I already drew it. And then I just transfer it on, um, to the canvas. Um, that way it's on there. Perfect. Exactly where I want it. Yeah. But, um, but then like, you know, you do that whole full on raw umber type underpainting and then you realize, man, man, I probably don't need to really do that. So the next time it's just, you know, I'll just do a little bit of raw umber or burnt sienna, or whatever, just to kind of get some shadow in there just a little bit. And then just yeah. start direct painting. And then you just kind of start, the more you do it, you kind of just start yeah. eliminating, like, is it really necessary? To, you know? It's in the, yeah, so it's I, in the shape I, I, where it actually, that, that stuff is super beneficial to have an underpainting because you can, yeah. when you lay something down and you work in the shadows, then that makes, that enables you to paint much more thinly in the shadows. So the shadows have that transparent quality and the thicker yeah. paint highlights. That's, that's where it, what I do falls down a little bit. But I've been able to work around that. And I think for the type of work I'm doing now, it's not that important. Like it's not really important to be – it's not important at all to have any form of brush work. It's not important to have like sort of uh, like some warm undertones sparkling through because there's, there's no flesh tone. There's no – none of that stuff is really beneficial. So right now it's not, it's not something that I – that I really am concerned with. It's more just about pace and um, trying to trying to chop off. Like I literally have a piece of paper in my studio that's like this big, and that's my goal for each day is to paint that amount of square inches. And I tile that out so I know that you know this painting is is 21 of these 
of my of my little daily goals. And so I'll try to get – so hopefully this pain takes me 21 days. But, hey, if I can get a day where I get like one and a half of those in, maybe it becomes like a 19-day painting and I can get it done a little quicker. Yeah. And then cumulative impact of, of you know, beating your own deadline um, over the course of a year and over the course of, you know, a career – is significant because it means you can just make more work. And if you're making stuff that is good, um, you know, you just never know that there's that one painting that can just, like I have a thing that I say, and I say it quite often as people maybe heard me say it, but I always believe, you know, one painting can change your life. You should act accordingly. So um, okay. I'm always looking to just to, to grind out one more painting in my year and not like, spit out some crappy thing but like to get one more quality painting because you just never know it might be the painting that gets that goes viral it might be the painting that gets purchased by an important collector you know you just never know what's going to happen and and the more bullets you can put in your gun the better it's going to be for you yeah yeah no that makes perfect sense um that's awesome man no that's it's really cool i really love hearing the the, the process because you know most people are just you, like that follow you are just used to seeing like hey here's the final painting you mm -hmm. know but um and a lot of us a lot of the people that that listen to this podcast a lot of them are artists so we know there's a lot more to it than that you know but it is really cool to to you know to look at your paintings and then talk with you about it and realize oh the guy's actually human okay that makes sense <laughs> um no because uh it's you your work has such a um powerful like visual like like some of the pieces that really you know it, i guess it's it's one thing to do to just you know do an amazing like uh portrait or you know nude pose or whatever but what i always loved was that you did something completely different like you like it almost like the the, the the couple paintings where you have a almost like a like a color like i don't even how, how would you describe it like um, almost like a uh clear transparent color laid over your lens and your camera so everything is in this like like weird yellow tones and whatever else and then yeah. on the top of that they're holding up a giant aluminum ball or whatever it is it's like there's always something where it's like yeah. um something different than just a, a, a poor a person posed or whatever and i just really always appreciated that you were taking it somewhere else different and um yeah. also just it's more visually interesting because I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, you're you're trying to survive in the fine art world. It's you've got to have your own voice. You got to be unique, um, and that's mostly probably the most difficult thing I think as an artist is how can mm -hmm. I like not be like like twenty feet under the water? How can I be above where people can hear me screaming? You know, because it's like there's too many uh, artists out there. <laughs> yeah, the the world doesn't the world doesn't need another one of us. You know, yes. and if your client if you Oftentimes, you, if you're trying to climb to the surface, you're like pushing other heads down underwater too. Like you're you're <laughs> knocking someone else underwater if you're if you're lucky enough to get up there. Um, but I also think that you know in a, in a in a culture now that's so driven by analytics and, and and data models and things like that, the world needs artists more than ever because oh, yeah. um, you know there's because there's no there's no reason for us to exist. That's the very reason that we should exist. Um, yeah, there's no, no that's true. Saying, "Hey, we need more artists." You know, they, they, yeah. just, um, well, I mean, it's, it's such an amazing time too, though, because I mean, you get on Instagram, for example, and there's so like, like that's the one thing I love about Instagram. Every day, there's some other artist that pops up, or I'm like, "Whoa, who's that?" It's yeah. crazy. Like, but it's also like the worst thing too, because. <laughs> if, if you're in the if you're in the wrong place with your work, and it's very easy to to for the for the brain to flip from wrong place to right place and right place to wrong place, but if you're in the wrong place mentally with your work, all of Instagram kind of seems to coalesce into yeah, this just yeah. this one mythical artist who is just constantly producing the best stuff ever, and it just like hits you and hits you and hits you, and it can be kind of defeating a little bit too, and. Um, and I don't know that it's for, for, for a younger artist who's probably more susceptible to that kind of influence. I don't know if it's in, it's the best thing because I think a lot of work that I see now is it's highly derivative of, um, of, of other stuff. And you can like literally trace back the influences. But I, I get it because like, when I started, you know, it's interesting you say like as an artist, you, you need to set yourself apart and have a voice to be different. Um, I spent 
you know, my, like a good year or two as I was trying to think about and trying to be an artist. Um, I, I literally, now that I look back on it, spent my time trying to be anything but different because I wanted to be the next one of this guy and I wanted to be part of that gallery and I wanted to, oh, yeah, and if, I, yeah. if I wanted to be represented by that gallery, I need to do those kind of paintings. And I ended up, when you think like that, it, it sucks the soul and it, it sucks the individuality out of your work. And it was only when I actually took that work to those galleries that I was targeting and had them look at me and say, well, I can't sell this. I can't sell this to my, my clients. It's, it's good, but it, it's not appropriate. But I realized that mm. I was never going to be one of those guys. Um, and, and the sooner I stopped pretending to be one of those guys and the, and the harder I lent into the kind of guy that I am, the, the, the clearer the path would be for my ideas to flow because there's enough, you know, there's enough blockades and enough obstacles as it is. But if you're busy trying to pretend to be someone else with your work, um, that's just another obstacle that, that's going to, that's going to, that's going to throw you off. And, you know, yeah, we're all a in a race, you know, we're all trying to move like, as artists, we're all moving down the same road and, um, you know, coming up behind you, you know, there's that, that, that big thunderstorm that's kind of, that's, that's life. And if you get caught in that storm, it's hard to get out. And so we're all trying to move. And so if you are moving slowly down that road because you're too distracted by influences or there's, there's things in your life that are getting in the way, you're going to move slower than the next person. And that thunderstorm is going to get you before it gets someone else. And you may have the most talent. You, you may have the most potential as an artist, but if you get caught, then that other person is going to, so it's, yeah. a, it's a attrition, you know, and, and that's, yeah, that makes I, sense. I, I think of it like, I, I feel like I go to battle every day and I used to, I used to, um, you know, coming from a sports background where I play basketball, like, you know, you go to the gym and you always had that, that old saying in your head, like, if you're not working hard, someone else is. And when you play them one-on-one, -on -one, they're going to beat you. I have the same, I still do. But back when I was first starting, I had that same perspective as an artist. And I had the goal in my first couple of years as an artist that, literally no one in the world was going to work harder than me and no one was going to put in more time and no one was going to give more of themselves to their artwork than I did. Some people may equal me, but no one was going to do more than me. And um, I don't know if I achieved that, but I did everything I could and I, I gave everything I could to it. So, um, you know, that, that aspect of it is, is um, it's really important too. Like, uh, cause it's not just about making, like a, being a one hit wonder and making one good painting, you've got to, it's yeah. about consistency. You've got to, so you make one good painting and um, you can show that to a gallery or show that to whoever they're going to want to see what else is, what else have you done? What else is there? And if you don't have anything else to back it up, then they're moving on to the next person. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, that's interesting. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. So yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. But I, it was, it's, it's interesting thinking about it. I was thinking when you were talking about how, uh, when when I was first getting started in illustration, um, I basically I knew what my strengths were, mm. and like you know I was really I was I was in, in obsessed and loved caricature, um, and at, but at the time I couldn't paint, like I wasn't a painter I was but I could draw, and um, and but I knew I wanted to to do. I wanted to be one of those illustrators that's doing caricature and I felt like I had a different voice than other people. Like I felt like I've been developing my own sense of humor, my own style, my mm -hmm. own way of capturing a person, their likeness and whatever, you know, and, but I wasn't really making it. And I realized it, it was, it's actually, it actually was the, the night my, my first daughter was born was mm -hmm. that, um, I, I had a complete breakdown, mental I breakdown. Remember the story. Tell me yeah. again. I remember you telling well, me that. I, he is, yeah. yeah, like I, I was basically, um, you know, my wife at the time. She, uh, she was going through pre labor. She was, she was having contractions. So her friend came over and they went to the bathroom. My, my wife got in the tub and they said that if, if you know, if you get into a hot tub and the contractions keep going, uh, you're, you're, you're in labor. So, so it's just like a kind of a just a test to see how it's going and see which how how much time we have. Um, and I started having a panic attack. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember like my voice in my head, you know, I'm alone in the apartment there in the bathroom and I'm like, 
I'm 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 a loser. Uh, I can't like what I'm a, I'm pathetic. You know, I'm supposed to be thinking I'm about to have a baby, and I, you know, I, I'm not really doing as well as I want with my art, and I, I can't paint. You know, you're a loser. You know, like you can't. You're not an illustrator, and like you you can't compete with these people unless you you can paint. And I I remember thinking, either I have to start figuring out something else to do with my life right now, or I have to teach myself how to paint because I remember thinking like Roberto Parada and C. F. Payne. And um, Daniel Adell, Thomas Fluharty, all these different artists that were making it in, in the kind of field that I wanted, that I was interested in doing, all of them could paint. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I, I can definitely keep up with them when it comes to, to the drawing part of it. And I, and I remember thinking, if I could learn how to paint as good or better than them, then I'm going to make it no problem. And mm-hmm. I remember that just like clicked in my mind. I'm like, I have to learn how to paint right now. <laughs> and she's literally in the bathroom, and I I went got my I got my I got watercolors out. I remember I um, flipped through a magazine. I tore out a, a, a picture of Owen Wilson, and I just did my first painting like right there. I just um, I remember she her coming out of the bathroom like an hour later or something, and I'm I just did my first painting. She's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm painting," you know, "I'm painting." I'm 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 painting now. This is what I do. Um, so I did my first painting, and then that night, um. Uh, her water broke. We went in and had my daughter the the er, er, really early the next day, and it was so so, so surreal. The whole thing was very surreal. Um, and then we got home and everyone's sleeping, and I I get out my paints. I do my next painting. It was a painting of of fifty cent, and I just never stopped. It's just that yeah. was it. I just every day just paint 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 paint. Taught myself. Started with transparents because um, I you know it was it was scary. So I figured I, with watercolor I can slowly build up to to opaque. Then I yeah. then I was like I'll just do acrylic. So acrylic really really thin, really light, so I could control it. And then all of a sudden I started having the balls to be opaque, and then realizing wait, values. Yeah. It's all about values, and and the correct one laid down to the next to the correct one. It's like putting a puzzle together. I, I don't need to do transparent. I can just go in there and start sculpting and bringing it to life. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden it was like now I'm painting. Um, and I and I started I started uh, getting like better jobs right away because um, all of a sudden now I'm painting and it was like it was almost like I just learned a, a, a superpower somehow and then um, I started getting really stressed out with the deadlines and everything um, but then eventually a friend of mine Joe Bloom and my dad both recommended they're like dude you should try digital painting uh, and I was like no nah, that's stupid that's not art that's you know that's I, I always thought it was um, cheating, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but then uh, basically what ended up happening was I got this job for Muscle Magazine to to do a painting of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I just – I decided, you know, I'm going to experiment. I went to Best Buy and I bought like a little small a graphite a graphire, uh, yeah. tablet. Yeah. And um, it was like 100 bucks or something. And I never had digital painted before. And I, I – scanned in my sketch of Arnold Schwarzenegger and I just start messing with in Photoshop and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is like painting, but I can paint faster. And because of that, I'm, I can zoom in. I can do more detail quicker. Um, it was just all of a sudden I did this painting, I handed it in and they were, their response was, Holy crap, this is awesome. Yeah. And I, and I just, I made a decision at that moment that from now on, whenever I do work for publication, editorial work, it's all going to be digital. I'm not messing around anymore with mm-hmm. the stress or the the craziness of the deadlines, um, which by the, I'm sure you, you'd already know this, but like it's still crazy stressful, even though I'm doing it digitally, <laughs> you yeah. know. Um, but that was the key. It was like for me, it was like okay, I need to learn how to paint because otherwise, I'm not going to be taken seriously in this in this industry. I'm not going to be able to compete with these guys that are doing covers, you know, if I can't paint. And so yeah. I had to force myself, like, you gotta gotta paint, dude. You gotta start doing this. And I think I was twenty oh, I think I was twenty six, maybe. Yeah. When I started when I really started painting. Because yeah. up till then it was I was just like just drawing. Just draw, 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 draw. That's all I really did was draw. So that that part, the drawing part to me is like that's like an extension of that's like I have no problem drawing anything. Yeah. But the, the painting part was so scary. It was like so scary. Yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> I avoided it. I think I said before, but like I, 
I avoided it for the first 27 years of my life. And it wasn't until like almost 14 years ago today that I did my first acrylic painting. And I remember it so vividly, um, not because my wife was giving, <laughs> giving, literally giving birth in the room next door, <laughs> but because it had been this, this thing, this huge monkey on my back because I hadn't, it's not, I had always wanted to paint, but I knew that the results that I would get were nothing compared to what I could do with a pencil. And I wasn't prepared to do something that I was not good at. I spent my whole yeah. life only one sport because I was really good at it and never tried anything else because I wouldn't be as good. Uh, same with art. I spent my whole life drawing just with, with graphite pencils. Um, made the huge leap into colored pencils <laughs> in college. And that yeah. for me, that was that was a big moment. But I, I realized I could do that. But it took forever. And it wasn't until like I, because I'd learned everything else. By, I, I'd done pen and ink. I'd done watercolor. I'd done a little bit of gouache. And I was like cobbling together some sort of Frankenstein result. Yeah. <laughs> yep. All for the purpose of avoiding actually doing a painting. And gradually, like, I, I did a one painting, I did the background in acrylic and it took me a whole day and it was like this sky, uh, the background was a, like a cloudy sky, like a stormy sky and so bad, but it took me all day. And after that, like gradually, like a little bit more of acrylic and acrylic crept into it to the point where I had done this other painting where I'd, I'd done a background and a girl with a dress on um, and I, and the hair and I, or not, not the hair, but, so that anything, that, the only thing that was left was the hair and the face and then everything else was acrylic. Um, her arms, her dress, her back, everything. And then I got to the face and I got out my colored pencils and watercolor and I start like noodling away on the face. And I just, I had this moment of, Oh my God, what are you doing right now? Look, at, look at yourself. Like just, just nut up and, 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 and keep going with the acrylics. And so I did, and and that moment w when I finished and I looked at it and I could not believe that I had this guy who'd been terrified of making an acrylic painting or any form of painting for yeah. 27 years, this thing was sitting in front of me and I couldn't believe that I was the one that had made it. And <laughs> I've been chasing that feeling um, yeah. ever since because it's just the best feeling. And that thing stuck in my – stayed on my table for – months i couldn't because i couldn't stop looking at it because i just look, couldn't believe that i'd done it and um yeah. i had the same feeling when i did my first oil painting too and um the feeling fades after a while like you you know you don't it's only so many breakthrough moments you can have but yeah it's like a drug you just keep chasing it and that's what kind of makes me always want to keep pushing forward with what oh, i do yeah. oh yeah. that's awesome man i can't wait to see the the new stuff that you're working on man it's awesome it's so cool. I'm Thanks. so bummed too that I wasn't able to come over when I was there. It was like oh. it was so last minute. It was, um, yeah. yeah. And then like I got so then you know, you know, afterwards of course. Then I got invited by some of the comedians to hang out with them, and I was already there. And then then there was another show up on I think the main room or the belly room. I can't remember which one it was. And then I went up there and hung out with the comedians and watched oh, them. You and, do it. Yeah. And it was like it was so surreal because I I wasn't expecting them to be all so nice and wanting to hang out and stuff it was really weird but i mean that place for those of you who obviously people don't know uh jason visited the, the comedy store when he was here and i live about 50 yards from the comedy store and he posted a photo on instagram that he was at the comedy store i was hoping to get up and do a minute <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i was like sure can we catch up can we meet and uh, I'm right here, but um, then I then I realized that you were meeting with uh, like the comedians there, and like you got it, when you're there and you're with the comedian. I mean, that place is historic. Anyone who's anyone, yeah, it was. Been it, I felt like it was Christmas. Because, yeah, because like like it's it's funny. A lot of people are like, "You're really getting into this comedy thing." It's like, dude, I've been into comedy for a long time. I just um, I have a full time career as an illustrator, so um, I it, I've never taken it seriously to go try to do it, but now I am. And, and I'm having fun and it's a, it's a very slow process, but, um, I realized that I feel very natural at it and I feel, um, you know, I've, I've only gone up on stage a couple of times now and it's the best feeling in the world. Like, I love it, dude. I love, if I get made people laughing and stuff. It's the best thing ever. Um, yeah. it's really scary because you don't know if, the, if your material works or not. Yeah. You know, it's funny to me. 
you know, and it's funny when you say certain thing that you, you're like waiting, you know, you're waiting to hear get the laugh on this. And instead you you hear, oh, shit, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, OK, that was not what, what I was think, hoping was going to happen with that <laughs> one. But um, but yeah, it's a lot of fun, man. So, but yeah, yeah that, that was that was surreal. The exact opposite to, like as an illustrator and artist, you can kind of just hide behind your work and like you don't have to front up. You just you make it. And sure, there may be people that comment on social in social media. But you don't have to read those comments when you're standing on stage. Which I can't even imagine just instant Dude, back. My, and, the, the first time, hide. the first time I got up uh, in Chicago, I wasn't, I I wasn't sure if I was going to get picked or not because you put your name in a bucket and it's a room full of comedians, and I, so I got. They told me they they said the first five and I was number three. So I'm like, I'm going to go up. This is awesome. So. I'm sitting there watching the first couple. Every one of the comedians has a notebooks out. They're like, they're like reading out their notebooks, and I'm like, oh, that's weird. I'm like, I got my stuff down, and um, then I realized that's actually what they do at open mics. They, they're trying out new stuff, and but yeah. I'm like, I want to just go up there and be like, hey, I've done this for years, and um, it was really cool, man. I just grabbed that microphone and I just started going right into my stuff. Started get, I was so nervous because everyone tells you the, the you're gonna eat a bag, a big bag of dicks. Uh, yeah, and you're, it, it's you're gonna you have to be prepared to bomb, uh, and but I didn't want that. I did not want to bomb. I wanted my first time oh, to yeah. just be like I want. I was like, if I can get people to laugh a couple times, success. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, they only gave me four minutes at this place, and I had five minutes ready, so I had to figure out what to take out, mm-hmm. which was kind of you know I was kind of improving some of it, but um, but man, I got laughs the whole time. Yeah, and I was like. I you couldn't stop my grin. I got off stage. I was like, I was like, dude, I didn't bomb. <laughs> like I didn't bomb. Like I, that was the coolest feeling ever. And um, right away, I called my wife. I'm like, I did it, and I didn't bomb. I'm like, this is awesome, and I was so excited. But it's addicting because then I just wanted to do it again. You know, <laughs> it sounds awful to me. Like I'm my palm. I've got, literally got sweaty palms just listening to you. Like I, I could not do anything like that. Palms it's, are sweaty. Mom's spaghetti. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. what he was talking about didn't he yeah it, it's, it's, uh, it's it amazing. is nerve-wracking it's nerve-wracking because like i mean right now i'm preparing to open up for steve Byrne in december he's a big comedian he's at the comedy store all the time yeah he was he was on my podcast and we talked about comedy and he could see how much i want to do it and he was just like you just got you know you got to get out there and do it and he goes you know what i'm coming to chicago in december i want you to open five minutes for me and i'm like what so i've been like Wow. writing and writing and writing and um trying to get out as much as i can it's just difficult because i got kids and i got my deadlines yeah. and um but uh it's i i've learned from just for well, just for myself personally like yeah. i kind of come i've come up with my own comedy philosophy for, for, for jason is if it makes me laugh it's probably funny mm. but i have to figure out how to deliver it in a way yeah. and also i have to not care they have to not care like that's the tough spot then yeah like well yeah. and also just like i don't care if you don't laugh or not like i'm just gonna and like m- i find that most of the stuff that I'm, I'm talking about will make most people super uncomfortable mm-hmm. and that is even funnier to me yeah so like you know i started thinking about what's one of the most uncomfortable things uh you know masturbating let's talk about that you know like let's just go <laughs> Let's go right into it. I, you yeah. know, uh, you know, you know. I, start, I just come up with the craziest ideas. Like, I wonder what you know. Hitler probably masturbated, right? So let's talk about that. Let's think about what Hitler must have been like. You know what I mean? Like, you just, <laughs> you just like you start thinking of things that are just so crazy, and then just but they make you laugh. And then why does it make me laugh? And what can I do with it? Mm-hmm. So it's it's definitely an art form. And I've been like, I, I mean, I've been like rewriting and rewriting and scrapping and. Yeah. Like usually, usually, like now, I got I'm you know I got deadlines and paintings and everything. I I get up in the morning, I have coffee, I'll come down here, and um, I get my iPad out and I just start typing some ideas, or I'll read through what I have and then like, oh, it gives me a different idea. So I give mm-hmm. myself a certain amount of time, and then I'm uh, back to drawing Giuliani or whoever it is. So yeah. it's like, <laughs> like it's just another thing that I've added to my daily thing now. So it's interesting. But I think it's important to 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 have things that keep your mind ticking over because there is a certain, like when, when you're a, a bit of a craftsman like me, like uh, 
there's a time when like it's just kind of a little mind numbing you know and I don't really have to think when I paint and if I have things that are keeping my mind busy that that I'm working on in the background um that's that's just that's great because it's hard to get those those wheels turning again once you've let them grind to a halt so if you can yeah. keep your mind busy that then so I'm sure that um what you're doing with your comedy is going to filter into your work as well like the idea you yeah. maybe start pushing ideas um <clears throat> because yeah. the execution is 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 there it's always going to be there you've, you've got that it's just what can you what can you do with it and i think that's you know to circle back to sort of what i do in art um like i have a way of painting that is um you know it, it, it is what it's going to be and, the, and that's who i am and i have that as my, and i know that that's my thing and i know exactly who i am as an artist now and i'm and i own it and i'm proud of it and I don't try to be anything else, but because I've, 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 I've kind of, it's almost like I've crested that hill and now I can see an expanse of what, of what I can do with, with, with what I, with how I do it, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I would assume that it'd be kind of a similar thing with, with comedy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things like, it's like the, the comedy goes along very well with just my, like I'm, I've always been like, I'm always the guy hanging out with everybody, trying to get a joke out, trying to get people to laugh, um, and I, it, it, it's always like an energy that I feed off of. Um, mm. Like even like a few years ago when I was a, the keynote speaker for Adobe Max, um, I didn't know when I agreed to do that event that I was going to be walking out on stage in a, in front of about eight thousand people. Yeah, and um, my nerves took over, and what ended up happening was funny stuff starts coming out. And and um, I remember just getting that whole crowd to laugh, and I was just like, "This is the coolest thing ever." Um, that's when my mind started thinking. Like back then, it was like 2014. I was just like, I, "You know," and I, but I just kind of felt foolish. Like, dude, you're you you just got married, you got kids, and you can't be a comedian, you know. But the yeah. thing is, it it does coincide like with my art a lot too, because you know, like. You know, I do a lot of realistic portraits and that sort of a thing, but also the caricature stuff. I've been doing that since I was like nine, ten years old, and it it's very similar to mm -hmm. comedy in a lot of ways. It's like the 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 way of thinking, uh, the way of like storytelling and that sort of a thing. Like you know, a lot of times in the the caricature illustration stuff, there's setup, there's a punchline, there's like different things like that. Mm -hmm. But the other similarity, and this is, goes with all art, I think. For me, I, I'm sure you can relate with this, but my mind never, never stops. Um, like I can't walk outside and see a certain color of leaves that are on the ground without my mind trying to figure out how would I make that color. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? Like, or I'll see like a, a color reflecting off of a different color and, and thinking about how would I capture that. Or I see a certain guy walking down the street, and right away I'm, I'm thinking about jokes or like. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't stop. Like there's always something, um, yeah. which kind of, I think it's just it's just a. I think I think every artist can relate to that, where it's yeah. just like once you like open up that that box, basically, it's like yeah. you're like it's always going. Like I'm sure you, you you've had times where you sleep you lay down at night to sleep and you really need to get some sleep, but all of a sudden you just start thinking about all these things and you can't stop thinking about it. Um, that happens to me all the time, especially with the comedy stuff. I'll be, lay down. And all of a sudden, oh, I get up and I just get on my phone with my notes and I'm just like, I just, I'm just starting to write this idea down. You know, it's like yeah. and I, lay, I close my eyes again and another one comes in. It's like, ah. Yeah. No, I, I find that the best ideas that I've ever had, they always seem to come like completely out of the blue, like a bolt from the blue, like that story I told about going on my run. I had yeah. another one where I had this idea at like 2.30 in the morning that, just hit me and turned out to be one of my, the best ideas of my career. Um, but, and it seems like they just come out of nowhere. Uh, we, we, and, and it's almost like divine intervention, but I, I firmly believe it's, it's that hard graft of, of just every day, your brain, like ticking over things, taking in information, yep. taking in sights and sounds and taking it internally and pushing it back out and, and just churning through all that stuff that kind of just, clears the pathway for those ideas to come through and you don't get those ideas without um you don't get those moments of inspiration without the uh the years of like perspiration of, yeah. of just like grinding um oh yeah for sure yeah, yeah. 
No, totally. Well, um, hey, we we've been talking for quite a bit, but before we go, um, there's a couple um, a couple fan art drawings I want to show you. Um, <laughs> but also, um, th- I got to do this. Uh, this is my friend Joe Bloom's favorite part of my podcast, and it's serious questions with Jason Seiler. <laughs> This is a very, very serious, so um, <clears throat> got to get in the right mood here. But uh, being that you are from down on Anda, down Anda, and um, you've got a completely <laughs> – good eye, Mike uh, – different uh, <laughs> uh, star constellation. Um, and then you also like to take these paintings that look three-dimensional, but they're actually flat. But you want to make them to not appear flat. How do you feel being all the way from down Anda? Um, about uh, this whole flat earth thing that's been going around. I'm just curious. Well, you mean the truth? <laughs> is that what you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> um, what does Robin Ely think about? about uh, or is Robin the, Ely? Yeah, um, Ely, Ely, Ely. Ely. What does Robin Ely, the basketball player, think about all this stuff? Um, I, f- I find it hilarious, but... Uh, I just I, I think it's interesting that you can you can uh, like like facts can be arranged and explained in ways that make almost any argument convincing. And we're in a world right now where <laughs> that's true. That, like you listen to some of this stuff and you're like, huh? Yeah. What? Why does the like you know why does that happen? Why you know that doesn't make sense? But then you know I I just for me I always just lean on science and I I, I think. Like, but don't a, you, they're lying to you, though. They're lying to you uh, I, I because they're, trying, they're the trying to biggest, fool you. <laughs> I'm a huge anti-conspiracy theorist because um, yeah. <laughs> I just think that it it, it just it, it it takes someone to assume like the worst of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To believe that these things are real, and um, there's always there's always a, like a simpler explanation for these things, and um, yeah, so I. Yeah, I, I kind of I chuckle at uh, conspiracy theories a lot, but the flat Earth, the flat Earth one is um, is is uh, it's one of my favorites. I yeah. just think it's hilarious. It's like, you know, one of the one of the things. Like, I was just talking with someone about this recently, um, and I, I don't really wouldn't care about it normally, except for the fact that it's alarming to me how many people are buying into this. And uh, so I've gotten into a little bit of arguments and, and uh, not mean, just like, you know, not not even like angry, just like, what are you talking about, dude? This makes no sense. And and like th- this one guy's like, do you feel the earth spinning? If it's moving at a thousand miles an hour, how come you don't feel it? And it's like, dude, if you actually look at the planet from space and you, you, you map out how much a thousand miles is, it's not very much space. It's very, yeah. very small amount of space. And you realize that the earth – only turns this much in one hour. That's a thousand miles an hour. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, and secondly, there's this thing called gravity and it's like, I don't know what I, I'm not a science person and I I'm confused that you don't understand this, but the, the funniest thing to me, this is the thing that drives me the craziest about this whole argument is that once you open up this idea and you start believing in it, then you start like believing really crazy things like the moon, they believe the moon is a light source. It's its own light source. <laughs> and I try to say, okay, what about, first of all, what about the lunar eclipse? You can see the shape of the earth on it. They're like, no, 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 that's, that's all, that's not true. That's not really what you're seeing. Okay, what about the phases of the moon? That's this whole thing you wouldn't understand, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> I'm like, okay, the sun, the, I, tr- I tried talking to this guy, like from uh, what I can observe with my eyes, without using a telescope or anything, the the the, w- the reason we see the moon is because of the sun, and when you see the shadows on the moon, it's you can always look at the moon and see where the shadow is. And as an artist, I can go, okay, shadows are here, sun must be over there. Oh, guess what? It is over there. That's why yeah. I'm seeing this part of the moon. And then they say, no, 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 no. That's that's it's a it's its own light source. And then the same guy told me that it's not made out of rock. You've been lied to your whole life. But I can see the craters without a telescope. Like, yeah. what are you talking? So anyways, I just think the whole thing is amusing and hilarious. I've listened to people talking about it. And it's like, at first, when I first heard about this, I was like, oh, this is crazy. But then I realized, holy crap, a lot of people, 10 minutes, it was like, if you look on some of these things, you'll see how many likes that it has. 
Yeah. But <laughs> I, think, what? I just I think that you know the, the whole the greater idea here is like when people people have a real sense of uh, disempowerment and fear in their lives a lot of people a lot of times and um, when you can subscribe to a, a conspiracy theory it gives you something that you can latch onto and you can explain why something that is difficult to understand and hard to explain yeah, is the yeah. way it is. And you can explain it because it's a conspiracy theory. And that gives you just that little feeling of warmth inside that tells you that things are actually okay and explainable. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's human nature. And we we do that all the time. I do that all the time too. But I don't I don't disregard, you know, like science along yeah. the way. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it just comes down to human nature. I like nature. how so rational you are about it. You're, you're you know, so like, you know, it's it's okay if you're gonna if you want to be stupid, but I just believe in science. <laughs> but, but, yeah, no, you you have to combine it with like a healthy dose of um, yeah. Kind of well, that's ignorance. what's crazy too is a lot of these people they they like a lot of these flat earthers, man. They when you talk to them, they they'll come back at with their own science that yeah. some of it's very convincing, and you're like, wait a minute, that. But wait a minute, you know, yeah, it's yeah. I, I find it very entertaining. I think it's hilarious. Um, but anyways, I had to ask you just because, you know, I've been to Australia that one time and I definitely yeah. saw a different star, set of stars. And um, it was uh, an amazing place, by the way. I got to go back again sometime. But I just, you know, somebody I, I also saw somebody from Australia on, on one post that I was reading saying uh like they were trying to say that Australia is not real, that it's not where people say it is and everything. It's like – and this Australian was just like, I guess I'm like an actor. I've, you know, I've, I've been <laughs> acting this whole time. <laughs> it's not real. I'm not – like it's just so funny how far it can go. You know what yeah. I mean? With the whole conspiracy thing. Like there's an ice r- r- th- ring around the entire planet and they won't let us go there. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's amazing. It's- and you know, social media now gives these people a way to band together, and it just becomes a thing. And yeah, some people need to find family somewhere. You know, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> and that was serious questions with Jason Seiler. <laughs> 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 that was fun. Okay, uh, real quick before we have to split, let me show you. Um, they, they only only have a couple uh, that submitted this time, but you will enjoy them, I'm sure. So, uh, can you see this? Oh, wow. So, this first one is by um, Alani Jimenez. Jimenez? I don't know. If, I think I said that right. See, this okay. is where I butcher people's names. This is that part. That's great. So, wow. It's so funny to see people draw, draw a picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this next one is – this is like a color pencil one. This is by Malcolm uh, Monteith. Or Monteith. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. He did a drawing. It's a very distinct style, I just realized, because he yeah. did a drawing of uh, – uh, um, I'm blanking right now uh, – of Kevin Nealon, and is very, yeah. very similar. Very, It's it's almost like graffiti-ish. Yeah. In a way. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And then this one – this is the last one. There's only three of that were sent. But this one is by Christopher Hersman. Wow. So – it's got this That's Terminator eye cool. thing going yeah. on. <laughs> pretty cool. badass looking. Yeah. Shoo, jung, 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 jung. That's pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. Thanks to everyone who did that. That's that's uh, it's, it's <laughs> flattering that people would take the time to draw my face. I appreciate <laughs> it. It's always it's always fun. Um, I love it because every time I do this, I don't know, you know, who's uh who's going to be drawing, what they're going to be doing, what techniques. Yeah. It's so we've had, we've had, do you know um, Aaliyah Chapin or Chapin? Oh, I don't know her personally, but I know the work. Yeah. She's yeah. Really fantastic. No, she's, she's awesome, man. Um, she was on – I had her on my podcast a while ago, and it was really interesting how um, people – it's like they know a certain guest is going to be on. And like for example, up, up to that point before that, everyone that was submitting uh, fan art was all mostly all caricature mostly. Mm. And then when I announced that I was going to have Aaliyah on, it's just all these like really nice, realistic portraits. Mm. Like, like yeah. it was it was shocking. Actually, I was like, yeah. "Where's the caricatures?" And I think it was just more that they look at her, they see her work, and 
I don't know if it's just like this unconscious thing, like I'm going to do a portrait or, you know what I mean? It was just, it was just like, it's almost like an interesting yeah, experiment they, there. <laughs> it's almost like they, they, they bow to, to the artist and they, they bend to what, towards what they do. Or it could just be a, you, she attracts a different audience and that, and when she's speaking and, and those are people that are more inclined to make those images. But yeah, that, that is Well, no, a lot of them were people that have submitted oh, before. Right. So I was like, oh, yeah, right. wow, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for um, hanging out and doing this, man. It's I'm, I'm glad we actually got to talk face to face after all these years. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm I'm always so excited to see everything that you post, uh, dude. Your work is freaking amazing. And um, uh, also, congrats again on having the twins, man. It's uh, a yeah. there's, there's nothing there's nothing like it. You know, it changes everything. Best thing. Yeah. Best thing they have me, but and best thing they have to work too. Of, of, I, I, I have such clarity when I work now and it's uh yeah it's the best thing it is oh yeah no it's it's like that's that's the thing I I think it's like a saving grace of, of sorts when you're because like I mean in my line of work and I'm sure you can relate to the stress uh, a lot of times it can be very very stressful deadlines can be stressful um, I hate dealing with things like bills and taxes and all these different things. Like just my wife actually handles most of that stuff because I just want to focus and I get stressed out super easily. Mm -hmm. And there's something about um, my studio is downstairs. So there's something about, you know, working all day long and just being like, ah, and then going upstairs and seeing my two year old just running and jumping around. It's like everything's OK now. It's yeah. all okay. it's, everything's fine. Yep. Like I, I can just relax, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's the best, man. I love it. So anything before we go that you would like to uh, uh, promote or have people, you know, direct people towards um, um, obviously your Instagram. Now so. you it. Um, <laughs> I have, I'm, I, so I, I teach uh, back in Australia uh, twice a year at a place called the Art Academy, which is actually a, 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 an art school that I started and I teach an oil painting workshop, which has um, been really successful and had some, really good results for a lot of students and i'll be doing another one in january uh oh, cool. january 16th through 20th five-day workshop so um if you're interested you can uh, jump on artacademy.com.au or just go to my socials and you can find it through there um but yeah it's a it's a great course we have students come from all over australia all over the world to take it so if anyone's interested love to see some some of you guys there that's awesome man yeah cool awesome man well thanks so much for doing this and uh thank you yeah, it's been it's been a pleasure, man. And let me know next time you're in LA, and we'll catch up for sure. Yeah, I'm um, I'm hoping I'm hoping um, that when well I'll probably hopefully do Lightbox again next year. Okay, um, but hopefully before then because it'd be awesome. And now I know where you live, I can uh, come hang out and go to yeah. the comedy store. Yeah, so. <laughs> awesome, man. Thanks a lot. We'll talk soon. Cheers. Thanks, Jason.